we are going to talk about um, augmented and virtual reality. This is your mini symposium in cutting edge technology. Uh, and um, let's see, we're going to talk about that. And let's see, there we go. Those are my disclosures. What is virtual reality? Um, it is a computer generated three dimensional environment. And uh, it is something that you can immerse into as a user. You can uh, interact with its elements through um, uh, joysticks and, and other controllers. And uh, in neurosurgery, when you dive into one of these skulls and environment, you can interact with it um, such that you can erase part of it. You can uh, so drill part of it. You can uh, rotate it. You can spin it as many angles as you want. Uh, you can fly through it. And then you can finally reset it, which is a very useful function because then you can look at one approach and then you say, I don't like it. I can look at another approach and so on and so forth. And we'll talk about what patients can get out of that as well in a little bit. Augmented reality, on the other hand, is a cousin of virtual reality, is a technology that superimposes a computer generated image on a user's visual world. So you, either through a microscope or a heads up display or um, Google glasses and, and, and whatnot, you can see um, uh, images uh, projected and overlay in augmented reality. The um, so here's what it looks like intraoperatively. Very briefly, you can segment the optic nerve, the tumor, and the uh, carotid artery, and it will project through a navigation track microscope in the proper size and the proper uh, anatomical locations, so that you can have basically a heads-up display for navigation uh, in your microscope or Google Glasses, a heads-up display or goggles, whatever you're wearing for the operation. Um, uh, is this uh, an important thing? Well, th this this is indirect evidence that it may be. Uh, this is uh, these are the numbers of articles on the topic over the last couple of years, over the last several decades, I should say. And you can see that the number of publications on VR and AR have have skyrocketed in neurosurgery in the last five years or so. Indicative, at least, that neurosurgeons are interested in it, if, if not um, if not in in fact using it uh, very very much. Uh, so uh, we wrote about this timeline in the recent uh, uh, article. Um, the other indirect evidence that is becoming more important is that journals uh, such as Neurosurgical Focus, as well as meetings such as mine, the one that I'm here now, the one in Bogota last week, uh, the one so uh, concurrent to yours, are all dedicating time and space to virtual and augmented reality during their meetings. Again, indicative that neurosurgeons are at least interested in the topic, if not using it themselves. So Mixed reality, extended reality, that's the term that, that basically binds VR and AR. Uh, in neurosurgery, we use it for education, for patient uh, engagement, for anatomical research and clinical applications. And we'll, we'll touch on most of these, but mainly focus on clinical applications today. Um, the first thing to say is that um, this system was invented for, for patient engagement, for patient education, if you will. Um, Patients, you you have to remember, uh, I have to emphasize, do not go to medical school. They do not interpret CT scans and MRI scans, uh, black and white two-dimensional pictures of their anatomy. So you can imagine that when they either put on the goggles or see the uh, uh, renderings on a, even just a 2D screen, you can uh, explain to them the anatomical basis of the disease process, why they're going blind, for example, in this particular patient uh, in the right eye, in the left eye, um, and why surgery may be necessary, how the operation may be done, and the challenges of the operation. So in this particular case, you see the mini uh, opening on the right side, but you could explain to them how uh, an alternative uh, operation may look like, why you would choose one versus the other. All of this in three dimensions that you can rotate and reset so that they get a much better, clearer understanding. And studies have shown that the consent process for surgery is much enhanced by VR. Let's talk about uh, other uses now for surgical planning mainly. Uh, this is for surgical rehearsal. This is a case of a pineal tumor. And you know you could do this many different ways. And th there's no more guessing. There's no more relying on experience to know that this approach is better than that approach. You can do all the approaches and then test it for yourself. Uh, this is, for example, the interhemispheric approach to this tumor. You can test it to say, well, this is very 
terrible for this tumor because the corpus callosum is in my way. You can test the next approach, which is, the, which is the super cerebellum for tentorial. And again, you don't have to rely on your uh, imaging, two-dimensional imaging, or your experience to tell you that this is better than that one. You can test it out. You can see that this particular approach has some issues because of the precentral vein of the cerebellum, but more importantly, the angle of the tentorium in the midline. You can see that my neck is really, really looking up um, and finally, we set it on this paramedian approach because of the experience that we had in VR in rehearsal. So that's very important and, and very useful, especially for young neurosurgeons uh, and trainees. So next, we're going to talk about how virtual reality married with the augmented reality, uh, but the navigation track microscope can give you intraoperative navigation uh, and other clinical applications. So what about the target and anti-target? So what, sometimes we want to avoid certain places during surgery. For example, the cochlear labyrinth, you don't want to drill into it. The carotid artery, you don't want to drill into it when you're doing a transferoidal surgery, for example. It would be very useful to have the x-ray vision. Now, we have navigation, but navigation right now is pointer-based and, and monitor-based. So you have to put the pointer in there, look at the screen. You're looking away from the surgical field. You can see the Superman here in this picture. Uh, doesn't have to look at a screen to see through the wall. He actually sees through the wall. So augmented reality gives us a little bit of that. An example of that is this Kawase approach. This is the middle fossil on the right side. The yellow is the meatal plane. The blue is the uh, cochlea. Uh, the purple line is the carotid artery. You would never drill into any of these uh, anti-targets or no-fly zones, if you will, uh, because the augmented reality shows you exactly where they are. And you can see that I'm drilling um, as guided by the meatal plane. Right, you can, that yellow line, that yellow that yellow bar there shows me that my posterior edge of my drilling, uh, and I'm being guided by that uh, in augmented reality. Again, you can do that with with two dimensional navigation, with pointer based and monitor based navigation, but it's much more cumbersome than having that in your field. Um, Extended reality has really changed a lot of, of my own practice, and I'll show you a little bit of how that paradigm shift that happens uh, between the last 20 years or so. This is a case of mine in 2001. Uh, he is, in fact, a rocket scientist. He works for NASA, and he came in with that. And as you recall, in the 1990s and in, in, in the early 2000s, and, and even recently, as early as late as yesterday, with Dr. Armefti's uh, uh, lecture, he still talked. We're still talking about big openings and bone removal to to, to uh, avoid brain retraction. So you can see that 2001 big uh, opening, big bone flap, uh, big incision, um, one piece FTOZ. Um, opening to get to this tumor. And he has had a great result. And this, he, this is the follow-up 20 years after his surgery. Um, now, fast forward to 20 years, and this is 2021, same tumor, maybe even bigger. Uh, we're no longer, I'm no longer doing a big FTOZ and, and, and all that. This is a tiny incision, mini terrione opening for a bigger uh, cavernous sinus tumor. Uh, but we used uh, the template and, and, and VRAR for, for guidance. And, and this has been very useful as a paradigm shift in my own practice. I'll show you how this is all done through this uh, pendulum swing towards keyholes. So the VRAR, how, how it assists in keyhole surgery is really all about placing the keyhole in the right place uh, with the right size such that you can operate um, properly and have a safe result. Uh, when the keyhole is not placed properly or is too small, it becomes very dangerous um, and uh, problematic. So I'll give you an example of a clinoid meningioma that we, we used uh, this ARVR for a keyhole. So this is a um, MFD group two meningioma. We are, you're, you're seeing me drilling. Let's go back just that went by just a little bit too fast. I am drilling uh, in VR, obviously, uh, inside the skull out. So the reason why I drill inside the skull out is because I know exactly where I need to put that uh, burr hole to do the mini terriono, and I can see the sphenoid ridge, the sphenoid wing, while I'm drilling. So I know that burr hole is placed in the right place for my uh, my my craniotomy. So there's the, the burr hole that I drilled inside out. Now I go outside in now to, to drill the mini terriono. And 
there you go. The, the mark uh, for the burr hole is right there. And the template of the drilling is right there. Now, now this is a view through the navigation track microscope with augmented reality overlay. So what we did there is that we saved the military owner opening that I did in rehearsal as a computer file because it that's the opening that I want after multiple tries in rehearsal. And this is the opening that I want and I saved it and I projected in, a, in the intraoperatively patients anesthetized in pins, uh, fixated in pins, and then boom, this template goes on and I can drill the, the burr hole in the exact place that I drilled the burr hole in the model. And I can open the uh, uh, keyhole in the exact place and size of the rehearsal. And with that, I know I can do this uh, very safely because I've done it in rehearsal. At least I've done that in, in VR once. There's your um, mark and then the incision is planned from that. Uh, again, project the burr hole, uh, on the bone and then the tumor comes out nicely after clinoidectomy uh, and so on and so forth. So that's how it can really help you with keyhole surgery, placing uh, the mini terrier opening uh, in augmented reality into the right place. And there's this timely incision and uh, the tumor's out. So the sphenoid uh, cavernous sinus uh, meningioma that you saw before, same sort of template, slightly bigger keyhole. Um, this is the template that we use intraoperatively. Again, intraoperatively, we project the same keyhole back on the patient who is anesthetized and open this on bone. Uh, we're marking the bone now, so we open the same uh, keyhole as we did before, and the tumor is projected in augmented reality during the resection to show the margins. Uh, and again, uh, comes out nicely with this guidance. Again, no monitor, uh, no monitor, and no uh, uh, pointer per se for uh, navigation just looking at your microscope and there's your navigation uh, images with augmented reality. There's the result for that particular one. Uh, another example, uh, I love this example because not a lot of people, no one in, on the planet really has done a lot of transorbital surgery because it's a relatively new approach. And so no one has 5,000 of these, no one has a lot of experience. So it helps to have some guidance and some uh, template, if you will. So the, here's a juxtacavernous meningioma that we decided to take through the uh, orbit, uh, do a lateral uh, orbitotomy. Uh, and, a, a, and a partial clinoidectomy. And this is highly facilitated by the VRAR. Here again is a template. This is a superficial template. to the deep template to the tumor. And we are drilling with augmented reality here. This purple line that you see is the anterior most aspect of the tumor in the orbit. So I know that I need to go beyond that uh, to finish the drilling. That little dot that you see is where the lateral extent of the clinoid is. And I know I need to take that bone off uh, during surgery to make a safe opening. So there we go. We continue the drilling uh, with augmented reality guidance. And then we see the meningual orbital band here and that uh, lateral clinoid uh, area. We cut the meningual orbital band to access the clinoid a little bit better. Partial clinoidectomy in the orbit do a middle fossa peel of the lateral uh, wall of the cavernous sinus, and then finally open the uh, dura, and there's the tumor right there sitting, uh, sitting duck, if you will. It's sitting uh, without any protection from anything because you, you, it's wait for, right for the taking. And there's that uh, particular result with that one, and we published that in an uh, operative video recently in Neurosurgical Focus as well. The next concept I want to give you is the use of a VR template and AR guidance for this concept called connecting the dots. Um, by the way, this, uh, this optimizing the keyhole concept I call the Goldilocks principle. Goldilocks, remember, is a story, a children's story about uh, a little girl going to a bear's uh, house and finding that the uh, porridge was either too hot or too cold or just right. And then she finally fell asleep on the bed. Not the one that was too hard, not the one too soft, but just right. So your keyhole has to be uh, a Goldilocks because it has to be just right, the right size, right, right uh, space. The next concept, this uh, connected dots concept is yet another children's sort of thing that we do all the time um, to, for their games. And you connect the dots, you draw this ice cream cone. Uh, when the neurosurgery becomes connecting, just connecting the dots, it becomes slightly simpler and slightly safer. Uh, this is an example of a uh, frontal horn tumor. This turns out to be a subependent moment. Now, what's different about this tumor? Everybody can get to this tumor. 
And not about it, it's not about getting there. It's about getting there with a keyhole that's optimally placed, placed minimally invasive surgery. So notice that this tumor is naturally not in Monroe. It is in the frontal horn. And all the conventional approaches that we use uh, for, let's say, intraventricular cranial pharyngiomas or, or colloid cysts and whatnot, uh, all those get you to Monroe, right? You, you go to the standard place, you go through so you go to Monroe. Well, we don't need to get to Monroe. We need to be anterior to Monroe. So how do we get there precisely uh, with a minimally invasive approach? Well, the VR and AR are very, very useful for that uh, without big opening, without having to do a big uh, corticectomy uh, and whatnot. So all you do in VR is set up your trajectory. So here, here it is. You're going to tour the anatomy in the ventricle. There's your tumor. You set up a trajectory to the frontal horn uh, from, let's say, Coker's point. There's your trajectory. And all you need, so that, that's the opening, that's all the opening you need to get down to this. It's less than, it's about a centimeter and a half at the most. Um, and uh, intraoperatively, you, pro you projected that opening in the navigation track microscope. Once you marked the, the opening, and once you open the incision and all that kind of uh, work, all you need to do is line up the, the start point of the trajectory, the, the red ball, to the end point of the trajectory, which is the blue little ball. And once those two balls and the ends of the trajectory are lined up as a single thing, you only see one sphere, then you all could just follow that down and you will never miss. And all you need is a tiny opening. So here you go, we're gonna mark it, we're gonna make the incision, uh, we're gonna make the corticectomy uh, right where we can see through this X-ray vision, right? So the two dots have become one dot because it's lined up. And there is never any doubt whatsoever that you're going to be in the frontal horn. Uh, and there it is, CSF coming out, put your cottonoid in there. And the tumor is again ripe for the taking like that. I have to tell you that, that for this operation, we try to... Um, we try to put a tubular retractor in there, um, either a brain path or a, um, a metrics tube for the minimum basis spine tubes. And those were both too big. This in fact was just a dime size opening about 13 millimeters or so. And those tubular retractors were all too big for this. So this is truly minimally invasive surgery. And again, significantly aided by the VR rehearsal and AR intraoperative. Uh, I mean, the second part of my talk really is about using this for research purposes. Um, you can imagine the, the uh, utility of this for teaching residents, for teaching medical students, anatomy and whatnot. And it turns out to be extremely useful for uh, investigations. These models that you see on the right side of these columns are all anatomically accurate, obviously. We tested distances, tested the distances, and tested the angles, they're all accurate. And the advantage of using these over cadavers is obvious. Number one, uh, all you need is a CT scan, an ordinary CT scan to transform into these models. And you got, you have thousands of, any uh, hospital have thousands of CT scans. So as long as they're high quality, very thin cut scans, you have thousands of specimen, anybody has thousands of specimen to drill skulls and, 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 uh, and, and work on these uh, without having to get cadavers. The other thing is that the, the instrument that you use to alter the anatomy, that is to drill or to alter the anatomy when whatever surgical form you want to test and the instrument that you use for measurement are all on the same platform. So you don't have to take the cadaver, do your uh, mock operation, take it to the CT scanner, integrate that with navigation to measure angles and exposure and, and things like that. So number of specimen and same platform makes it very simple to do some of these things. Give me, give you some examples. We, we published a, a study about the transciliary superorbital approach, looking at, again, different angles and exposures to the tuberculum cellae an ACOM complex, an anterior uh, communicating complex. Uh, and we published that in, I believe, um, World Neurosurgery. And this was another one in World Neurosurgery about the vertebral basilar junction and how taking the condyle opens that angle up in the in the linear fashion. The more condyle you take, the more uh, uh, angular exposure you have in a um, linear fashion, it increases. Um, and then we once again, did the um, comparison of three minimally invasive approaches to the uh, sphenoid, uh, to the um, uh, uh, 
uh, superorbital fissure and uh, foramen valley and so on and so forth, and tested out three different exposures um, and, and showed you which one is which. So we, we published a lot of uh, this with um, this sort of research on VR. Uh, well, the one I want to highlight is this particular one that was uh, published in August uh, about petrochemical meningiomas. So it's called a comparative study about approaches using VR models. And this is, so, you know, lots of studies have, have looked at these different approaches and the exposures to, to petrochemical region. But the question is how much does the tumor itself change that exposure? Uh, none of these are done, these uh, studies uh, anatomically are done in, in, in patients. You can't really do them in patients because you're testing approaches. And it, the cadavers that these are done on don't have tumors. So they really don't address how the tumor itself can alter your surgical exposures. So how does the tumor change the, the surgical exposure? Can the cadavers really give you a Leo life data on this? Obviously not, that is a rhetorical question. And finally, how can we compare approaches and exposures to tumors, not to just the region itself, but to tumors? Well, in comes VR. Uh, the central question of our study was how much of the petrochemical meningioma is not exposed, invisible for X approach, Y approach, and so on and so forth, and the comparisons within the same model. So this is the first study that we are aware of that uses patient data to create laboratory specimens. The, the, the patient data becomes a specimen that you can manipulate as if it was a lab model in endless ways because you can reset it. You can do approach A, B, C, D, and reset in between all of them and test out a thousand approaches if you really wanted to, to a particular tumor. Um, where do I get all the data? I had to go to Beijing to help me get all the data. Uh, this is Tiantan Hospital in Beijing, uh, the Capital Medical University. They do approximately 500 petrochemical meningiomas a year, uh, a referral center for half a billion people. Uh, and uh, they had the data for me, thin cut CTAs and MRIs preoperatively sent it to us and we rendered it and then we did the experiment. So the inclusion criteria were large petroclavum meningiomas that at least span zone one and zone two of the clivus and must have both CTA and MRI pre-op um, to uh, be included in the study. We found 15 of these patients with tumor sizes ranging from here to here. Um, and um, here's an example. So we rendered the, the model, okay? And we only were interested, we were only interested in zone one and zone two tumor. Uh, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, this is not testing the tumor above it, this is not testing zone three down here. This is really just about the exposure to zone one and zone two. And so we just only included the tumor that was in zone one and zone two to look at it. And of course, we segmented the brainstem and colorized it here. And so this is one of our models. This is model number, whatever number it was. So with this model as segmented here, we then did openings that we want to test. So this here is the extended retrosigmoid approach. And you can see that after the approach was done, we um, removed the tumor or erased the tumor that we can see through the surgical opening. And we, we were very careful to examine that surgical opening in three dimensions, because after all, you can rotate it, you can look at it from down to up, up to down, side to front to back, back to front. All the tumor that was exposed, we took away. We, um, we left the brainstem alone. We didn't the brainstem can block me and the jugular tubercle and bone can block me, but nothing else can block me. So here's the exposure. We erased everything. And then now we, we dive in there and we see what tumor was left over. You can already see that there's a tiny little bit of tumor that, that, is, that you will see in a second. So that bit of tumor, both in the dark red as well as the bright red, we call invisible to the approach, right? Because you weren't able to see that uh, part of the tumor uh, from the outside of the approach, and we measured that volume and recorded it. This is the same tumor, same model, done through a retro labyrinthine posterior putrosectomy, posterior petrosal approach. You can see that the labyrinth remains. Here's the facial nerve and mastoid segment. This is the pre sigmoid opening. And again, we examined the tumor that was visible to us from outside and then finally dove into the tumor, dove into the skull to look at the residual or invisible parts of the tumor. Um, 
like that. So then we, we did other approaches and, and did all the measurements and compared uh, apples to apples, meaning that we, we um, each specimen became its own control because we did paired wise T tests uh, of let's say the retro labyrinthine with the retro sigmoid and see which uh, and how much of the delta there is of the tumor that was invisible and then show the data that way in a pair T test. Uh, so each specimen was its own control. We also did some measurements of freedoms, the six targets and so on and so forth. The major finding was that the retro labyrinthine approach at the highest blind tumor volume in zone two. So, you know, as much as Dr. Almefti uh, talks about the posterior petrosal approach, um, without taking the labyrinth, there is a lot of tumor that is quote unquote hidden by that labyrinth on the clival side. The extended retrosigmoid has the least tumor volume that's unseen in zone two. The combined petrosal approach has the least tumor that's unseen overall. So, you know, if you want to simply measure how much tumor and how little tumor you leave behind, the combined petrosal approach has the least tumor unseen overall. Uh, here's another important point, and that is the for the extended retrosigmoid approach, the total average blind tumor volume had an inverse relationship with the total tumor size. That means that for the retrosigmoid approach, the extended retrosigmoid approach, the bigger the tumor, the less blinded volume, showing you that the tumor actually opens the exposure for the retrosigmoid approach. This is the first time anybody has objectively shown that the tumor increases the surgical exposure for a particular approach, in this case, the retrosigmoid approach. The total tumor volume and the binding volume had no relationship with the petrosectomies. That makes sense because for the petrosectomies, the tumor does not expand the approach because the blinded parts are all behind bone. The tumor does not remodel the bone as easily as it pushes the brainstem backwards. So we also proved during this study that the blinded tumors have on different sides. For the petrosectomies, the blinded tumors on the clival side, on the dural side. For the retrosigmoid approach, the blinded tumor volume is on the brainstem side or peel side of the tumor. So depending on where what the most important part you think for a particular patient to dissect, or you might want to leave tumor behind, whatever your, your goals are, uh, you need to understand that for petrosectomy, the, the, your trouble may be on the clival side, the retrosig trouble is on the brain stem side, take your pick, individual tumor, individual tumor, individual patients. So conclusions, again, the um, anterior petrosectomy was the champion of exposure in zone one, the extended retrosigmoid in zone two, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, I encourage you to read that study from August of uh, Neurosurgical Focus if you're really interested in that, all that detail. So the summary of current usage, uh, you can see here, I've talked to you about a patient engagement a little bit, surgical planning, operative navigation, of course, teaching and uh, surgical anatomy, uh, and as well as anatomical research. Um, I will leave time for questions. And so we'll only tell you that we are running a, uh, the world's first mixed reality fellowship. Uh, it is obviously a fellowship in complex intracranial surgery, first and foremost, but using mixed reality for all these things, anatomical research, navigation, innovations of, of use of the technology uh, in this fellowship. And I encourage you to look at our fellowship. Uh, and I really uh, am very grateful and honored uh, for the opportunity to participate in your mini symposium.